This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Coming from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 30 through 32 in the New Living Translation, notice there these words. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I'm speaking to you today from the subject, the new oil, the new oil. Oil is a sign of our wealth, but, and, and what makes something of extreme value to us is its scarcity. And uh, today, the world has become a mean-spirited world, a dog-eat-dog -dog world, a do-unto-others-before-they-do-unto-you kind of world. And uh, it does not represent the way of Jesus Christ. And here the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, uh, reminding them that this is the way that Christians ought to behave. He, as a spiritual father to this church, is, is bringing correction to the character that Christians are to have. It's, it's a problem when you become so indistinguishable in the culture that you can't tell who's a Christ follower and who is not. When the behavior is the same and there is mean-spiritedness and harshness coming from the, the, the church as it is from the world. We know they don't know any better, but, but we know Christ. And this is why he's saying, don't, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. He said, live, live with some values. So it's just, we're talking about the new oil, which is kindness. Just being able to be kind to other individuals. Uh, remember, you will not be remembered for how much you saved, but how much you gave. You're not going to be remembered for the dollars you made, but for the difference you made. So uh, we are here in the earth to be able to be a representation of Jesus the Christ. And one of the th good things is that it is true that you reap what you sow. And this is why Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Another word for mercy is kindness because kindness is mercy and mercy is kindness. So you could actually substitute it and said, blessed are the kind for they shall be shown kindness. And if you ever need kindness shown to you, be kind to someone else. And sometimes the kindness that is extended to you actually may not come directly back to you, but it'll come to your children. It'll come to your grandchildren. Sometimes you get blessed because somebody before you was kind to someone else. And, uh, and the blessing will continue, but kindness is mercy. Whenever you see the word mercy in Scripture, you could actually substitute the word because it is often translated as well as loving kindness. It's hard to be kind to people that you don't love. That's why we have a co command, because love is a decision, not an emotion. We are commanded to love your neighbor as you love your, yourself. You're commanded to love other people. So it is the new kindness because the world is so mean. They're so critical. They will criticize you. They will, they will shame you. They will try to cancel you. They, they will spread gossip and slander about you and, and go home and, and go to sleep and never think anything else about it. 
They will say all manner of evil against you. They will work against you. They will cheat on you and cheat with what belongs to you and, and, and think nothing about it because the world has become that kind of place. But we are called to be different. We are called to be difference makers. And, and, and you ought to live here in this world with this kind of, of a mindset that I want to make my presence, allow my presence to make an impact so that my absence can be felt. I mean, if your presence doesn't make a difference, neither will your absence. So you need to, I mean, when you, if you're going to be here, you may as well leave some signs, some good signs that you were here. So I, I, I like to think of it in this way because when I was a little boy growing up and, uh, and the name Brawner means dweller by the water. And so I've been by the water a long time. Uh, I grew up and we had a house on Savannah Beach. And, uh, and so I spent a, a good amount of time there and, 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 and the beaches of Florida as, as well. And so I, I get refreshed. My soul gets restored. He leads me beside the still waters and restores my soul. And, and every time that I was there, I would always find rocks and, 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 and love doing that sort of horizontal kind of skipping of where the, the rock would hit the wall. And see, that was before, you know, we had uh, electronic toys. We had to entertain ourselves out in nature. And if you had a rock and some water, you know, you had a game. And you could see how many times your, your rock could hit and, and skip on the water. And finally, it would plunge in. And wherever the, the rock would actually go in and disappear, it would then create ripples. Somebody say, say ripples. Your life ought to make ripples. So that when, when you die and your rock goes under the water and nobody sees you anymore, that the impact of your life still is rippling out in the people that you made a difference to. It ought to ripple to neighbors. It ought to rip, ripple to children and grandchildren and nieces and nephew. And I'm telling you, if your presence does not make an impact, your absence won't make a difference. So you need to allow yourself to make ripples that... They ought to remember your smile. They ought to remember that you always had an encouraging word. You ought to have a ripple. They ought to be, you ought to be missed when you leave. If you make a difference in the life of, a life of anybody, it's, it's a ripple effect that, that though the, the rock goes under the water and you don't see the rock anymore, you see the effects of the rock with the rippling of the waters. And so the waters have always represent multitudes of people. The waters, they represent multitudes of people. And so when your life has impacted people, I meant the librarian, people in the library, people in, at the grocery store, people at the post office, people at the bank, people at Walmart, people at the gro uh, grocery store, in the parking lot, at the gas station, they ought to be able to say, hey, remember that lady, she, every time she came in, she was always smiling. She was always saying something kind. She was always, she always was singing, humming, or doing whatever. This guy was always whistling. And, and this person was always saying, hey, man, you need anything? You need anything? You, you, want something? You, you want a piece of chewing gum? I mean, people ought to remember you for doing something kind. That why you're there, why you're there, why you're there. There are certain kind of people, my, one of my brothers uh, who's, who's in heaven now, but he, he used to always, he had a hookup for everything. <laughs> you need people in your life that has got a hookup. I mean, you need something fixed. I mean, they got, you call them, they, man, you got a hookup. I mean, it's something for the house, they got a hookup. I mean, he, he, had, he had a hookup for everything. I, if, whatever you needed, you got somebody, man, he had somebody in, 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 in his memory bank and somebody in, in, in his Rolodex. Some of y'all don't even know what a Rolodex is. But, he, but he, had, he had somebody that was a hookup, and you, you just, you remember, you remember, you remember. And like you want people, when, when they remember you, you want them to smile and not frown. So you, you make a, a good impression so that you, you make ripples so that even after your rock has gone under the water, that the ripple effect is still moving on, is still moving on, and, and the vibrations of who you have been in the earth are still moving, still impacting, still making a difference. Let me give you just some simple ways to be kind to others. So it, it, we have to spell this out nowadays. But use your words to encourage and not to tear down. Just use your words to encourage and not to tear down. In fact, 
in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, let me tell you what it reads. It says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. He was reminding that this is the way that Christians ought to be. Christ follow us, let no, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Now think about that for a moment. No unwholesome word come from your mouth. Can you imagine how different your life would be if you never spoke a neg negative word? Jesus said you shall have what you say. And if you don't like what you're seeing, change what you're saying. Because you reap what you sow and words are seeds. And every time that a father who's angry shouts at his child, and every time that a mother who is frustrated screams at her child, your screaming voice becomes your child's inner voice. And that's how you have to watch how you speak. You know, stupid child, you can't do anything right. And your frustrations of what you say in the moment becomes their inner voice of insecurity that marks them now trying to always do enough seeking your approval without even realizing I am accepted in the beloved. With God, we are not loved because of what we do. We are loved because of who we are in relationship to Him. It's not, it's not based on works. It's not because you've done all of the right things. So just use your words to encourage and not to tear down. Secondly, be quick to listen. Quick to listen. Quick to listen. Not quick to fire off at the tongue. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Here's the third thing. Acknowledge the image of God, the imago Dei, in every person, every human being on the planet. No matter how wicked and evil they appear to you, they are made in the image of God. They have an imago Dei on the inside. There's a God image on the inside of them. Every poor person, every person of another race, that's the imago Dei. They may not look like you. They, their culture may be different, but there's an imago Dei. There's an image of God. There's a divinity that is in them. Even the other folks, when they say namaste, it says the divine in me greets the divine in you. We are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. Every person, every person is made in the image of God. Whether you agree with their politics or not, you have to acknowledge the image of God in that person. And if you do that, it becomes very difficult for you to abuse that person and to subjugate them in injustices and slavery because you recognize the imago Dei, the God image on the inside of them. That's a God bearer. They're an image bearer of the kingdom of God. That's who they are. And it changes how you treat people so that you don't treat people like trash because of what you've heard and stereotypes. You recognize that's a God person even if they don't live with my values. They, they're created in the image of God. They have his creative ability. That's a, that person is an image bearer of God. So acknowledge the, the image of God in every person. Here's a simple thing. Smile. Just smile. It doesn't cost you anything, and it raises your face value. Just smiling at people. Uh, you'd be surprised. You don't know what people have gone through, and sometimes a smile can just relax people. It just says it's okay. It's, it's, it also says, I see you. I acknowledge you. Every person has a need to be recognized, to be seen. Just smile at people. Here's another thing. Give a person a genuine compliment. Give a person a genuine compliment. I mean, if their hair is laid, you know, I mean, it's, it's, acknowledge it. I mean, acknowledge it. I mean, you know, women go through a lot of trouble, you know. I mean, with makeup and eyelashes and nails and shoes and pocketbooks. And listen, it, that didn't just, they didn't just wake up like that. That is, that's some work. I meant from the front to the back, you know, just acknowledge it. Say, girl, you're well put together today. I like how you, yes, yes. Just acknowledge it. Just just give them a compliment. It, it doesn't take anything from you, and, and it, it, there's something about it that it, it lifts them. It lifts them. It, 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 it can shift a mood. When you come in with a compliment, a genuine compliment, I don't mean hyping somebody up because you want something from them. I mean just genuinely looking and said, you know what, that man, that, that's, that's just really good. You know, if, if somebody's braids are fresh and tight and their beard is on point, you know, just... If that outfit is well put together, you dripping, you dripping, you know, I see you. Just give them a compliment, for God's sake. 
Here's another way to be kind. It's just to be patient with people. Just be patient with people. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 says, love is patient and kind. Patient and kind. Not one or the other. They're, 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 they're connected together. Being patient with people. When you're impatient with people, with children or with elderly people, with your spouse, I mean, when you're impatient, it, it, it translates as unkindness. And when you're patient with people, it translates as kindness when somebody is patient with you. I mean, uh, you know, uh, if you're teaching them something and if they're having a hard time getting it, to be patient with them says, I love you. But when you get frustrated and start cut, cutting them out and calling them dumb and stupid and all of that, it, it does not translate as, as kind, I tell you that. And they may not say it to your face, but they're thinking some dirty thoughts concerning you, you know. <laughs> be patient with people. And then express gratitude. Express gratitude for any kindness that is given to you. When people are kind to you, when they have served you well, express kindness to them. I mean, I don't care if it's, if it's on an airplane, a train, a bus, if it's in a restaurant, if it's a cashier in a store, just express kindness. If it's a barber, a beautician, express gratitude for any kindness that's been given to you. And then exercise the principle of charity. Charity is where you give people the benefit of the doubt and you seek to understand them because uh, it might be that they weren't trying to be nasty to you. Maybe they just absolutely forgot to mention your name. Maybe your invitation to the party was actually lost in the mail. And you thought that they had a problem with you. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe they had a wrong telephone number. And maybe they were trying to reach. Give them the benefit of the doubt. That's the principle of charity instead of thinking the worst. Thinking the worst. I mean, don't, don't assume that because somebody is looking at whoever you're with that they're trying to hook up with whoever. Maybe you look like somebody that is a relative of theirs or somebody. You know, it's like you put me in the mind of somebody. Be charitable to people. Don't, don't assume the worst and then respond emotionally to that, to that assumption. Take a look at this little picture here on, on, on kindness. You see, this is why you should be kind to people. Notice the big blue circle, that's someone's life. And then notice the little dot, that's what you know about it. I mean, it, a, a person is a big entity. And what you know about it is like that little tiny dot. You don't know the struggles that they've dealt with. They might have had an alcoholic parent, a parent that was on drugs, somebody that was incarcerated, somebody that abused them, abandoned them. They might have been raped. They might have a certain level of, of, of mental illness. They could be reacting to medication. You don't know. That's just, it's a big life, and you see one element, and you make a, a quick, rash judgment based on that little dot of information, a stupid post that they made, and now you've made that the totality of their life. Be charitable. Be kind because somebody is dealing with a hard struggle and you never know when your kindness is just the thing that they need in order to, to keep their sanity. The last thing that they need is when their, their world is, is, is being wrecked and, and, and you're, you're, you're there at a stoplight and, and the light changes and, and you're laying on the horn and, and, and cussing them out and got your middle finger up. And little do you know that this person has been overwhelmed with so much and they've got a loved one who's in the hospital in intensive care and their mind is over on the other side of town and they're trying to deal with pressures at work and trying to keep their mortgage and their rent uh, uh, and, and, and the car note and, and, and the telephone on and all of these things and, and you don't know what they're dealing with and, and a little kindness goes a long way and the school has called them about their child and now they're dealing with a health issue in their own body and they've got so much that they'll stretch trying to take care of children here and aging parents on this side and they feel pulled from both sides. Who am I talking to? And you're going through stuff and people, when they look at you with a smile on your face, everybody who smiles and looks nice, they are dealing with a, a struggle in their own life. And did you know that the way that life is, even if you're good looking, you know good looking people still have problems? You can be cute as a button. I found out that drop-dead gorgeous people, they get diarrhea too. You don't know what a person has gone through. 
and what they are dealing with. They might not have slept well last night at all, and they, it's, it took everything on the inside of them to muster enough energy to put their clothes on and to wash their face and to press beyond depression and suicidal thoughts and to face another day coming out in the cold, in the rain, and trying to live their life and keep it going. And you're seeing a little dot of just one little thing that somebody walked in a room and didn't speak to you. Maybe they didn't see you. Use the principle of charity and just be kind because every strong person, I've never met a strong person with an easy past. You see strong people and assume that they're just strong all the time because they got to be strength for everybody else. But the strong person needs somebody to lean on every now and then. Even the strong person needs somebody to say, I, I see you. I know you're helping everybody else. Are you doing okay? Are you all right? You're, you're there for everybody else? How you doing? Ask somebody right now, how you doing? How you, how you doing? You'd be surprised. Now, I know you can't always be, an, uh, be honest with that because you can't, everybody can't handle all of that other part of your life. They just see the little dot that you allow them to have a little bird's eye view into, but it's, you're a whole complex entity. And they may not be able to, to deal with all of your history, and they certainly don't understand your destiny. And that's why you have to be able to deal with people who know you and understand your struggles and they look at you and they make assumptions about you that just because you're big bone that you're lazy. <laughs> you, you, may be, you may be putting out more energy and, and working harder than the skinny person. Again, they're looking at a dot, but you're a big circle. There's a whole lot more that's going on. Do you anybody understand what I'm saying today? But we have to grow in our understanding to be able to connect with people and to be merciful and kind to them. We have to grow. Jesus had to grow. He wasn't just born fully matured as God. I want you to notice Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Notice this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Notice that he increased in wisdom, that is something for his mind, and in stature, that's his body. Jesus developed both his mind and his body, not one or the other, both and. He developed his, his, his mind in wisdom, he developed his body in stature. He grew in both ways, and he also grew in favor with God and with human beings. And this is a balanced Jesus who was kind to people. And when you're kind to people, it doesn't mean that you don't ever get angry. You do get angry. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. So you will get angry. And that's why Jesus should be our goal, is to be able to grow in mind and in body. We should seek to become more. You know why? So that we can do more. The only reason that you need to have more is so that you can do more because to whom much is given much is also required so the more you have the more you can do if you're asking God for more just for the sake of having more that's not a prayer that God is interested in answering but if you're asking God increase me grow me God so that I can do more so that I can help more people so that I can share and that my reach will go farther than what it is help me God I want to grow in wisdom and in stature so that I can do more if I strengthen my back you can trust me with more weight God help me to become more grow me up God so that I can handle this because when I'm a child I got to deal with one thing at a time but as I grow up now I can handle several things at a time when I first started out in ministry I mean if I had to speak you know I mean it's gonna take me a whole time and I can't do anything else and now I have to work on, on several things I've got several things cooking in me now about upcoming events that I'm already working on I was working not yesterday on today I was working uh, yesterday on some things that's coming in the weeks 
I have to have a whole lot of things on the back burner that's already getting ready. Some of them are just simmering there that I'm leaving there, but I've grown to be able to have different things on the oven, on the stove now at the same time. I ask God to, 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 to grow me, not just so that I can be bigger and bigger, but so that I can help more, so that I can understand the hurts and the pains of other people so I'll know how to speak to it and be able to shift their perspective into a kingdom perspective. But I will say this to you, that not all kindness looks and feels like kindness at the time. Not all kind, kindness looks and feels like kindness at the time. And I would say this to you, that one of the kindest things that God will do for you is to allow you to fail when you're on the wrong path for your life. That's one of the kindest things that God can do is to allow you to fail when you're on the wrong path for your life. Let me say it to you this way. God will sometimes destroy what is set out to destroy you. God will ruin what was trying to ruin you. And that's a gift and it is God's kindness. You know how you were in school in the earlier years and you were all in love with somebody, you thought he was so cute and she was so pretty or whatever. And then you see them some years down the road broke, busted, and disgusted, and teeth missing, and then I got all big and just let themselves go, and they used to be so cute. And now, just like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. You better be glad that God let some things fall apart. I'm just telling you, it didn't look like kindness then. I mean, you know, people that, you know, you didn't have the nerve to go to speak to them, to ask them to tell them that you want to go together. I mean, when I was in school, you know, we had a little piece of paper that we would you know, will you go with me, you know, you know, and they checked the little box and stuff, you know. But those of us who were just terribly shy, we, would, we wouldn't even say anything. And then finally we'd see them with somebody and be like, doggone it. But then down the road, you're thankful that God allowed a plan to fail that you were hoping was going to happen because God knew some things about it that you didn't know and that you didn't understand at the time. Let me say this to you. God designed success so that it does not satisfy you. I'm going to give you that a, a, a divine selah. Do you just pause and just meditate on that for a moment? God did not design success to satisfy okay. and why not because God did not want your success to become your source All right. All right. God is your source God is your source if everything is by your own success that by my own hands and my own wisdom and my own understanding and my own finagling and my own working relationships I have cause these things to fall into place. Now you think that everything has been provided by you and God is our provider. He never designed success to satisfy. There are people that have the house and the clothes and the jewelry and, and, and the real estate and, and, and the uh, investment portfolio. They've got all of that and they're unfulfilled. They're depressed. They're dealing with anxiety. They don't sleep well at night. They have all of this stuff, all of the external accoutrements that say this is a successful person, but on the inside, they're still not satisfied. They got everything. It looks like they got everything. And they're still not happy because God never designed success to satisfy so that you will never use your success as your source. God is our source. God alone is our source so that when there's a need there that we depend on God himself to help us, to deliver us, to strengthen us, to guide us, to speak to us and give us the way. And it is not by might nor by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. So God has a reason for everything that he does the way that he does it. I mean, because what good would it do for you to gain the whole world and then to lose your own soul? 
Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Why? What, what good does it do to say, I've got all of this, and then you wind up and commit suicide? You got all of this, and then your relationships are broken. You've destroyed all of your relationships trying to climb a ladder to success, and now you have nobody to enjoy it with. I mean, where are the people that really, truly love you? You got all of this stuff now, and now you don't know who loves you for you. Do they love you, or do they love what you can do for them? God never designed success to satisfy. I just want you to understand that principle. God never designed it to satisfy. Should you go for success? Absolutely. But keep God in his proper place. Keep God in his proper place. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these other things will be added unto you. You see, here's one of the things that has messed us up in our world. We live so much down by the things of the world, we don't gaze toward heaven sufficiently. The Bible says that we are to pray. Jesus gave us a model prayer. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So that means that we're supposed to seek to do it down here the way that his kingdom operates up, up there. And see, the way that things operate in the world is I scratch your back and you scratch mine. I do for you and you do for me. That's a general understanding, and we have brought that same kind of mindset into the church world with God, and God doesn't operate that way. God's like, I'm God. I'm not in a negotiating table with you. I am God. I'm the Lord of the universe. I'm the creator of all of these things. I was here before. You, I gave you everything that you got. You can't negotiate with me. What do you have that I need? God is like, I don't need my back scratched. But we live with God with a mindset that if I scratch your back, you'll scratch mine. And so we get upset with God. And I know people and have met people who are offended with God because they're like, God, I was going to church. I was trying to live right. I was paying my tithes. I was reading my Bible. I was trying to pray. I was doing everything that I knew to do. And God, and you still, you still let my marriage fall apart. God, you, you still let me lose my job. I still didn't get the promotion. And you're going through all of these particular things of what you didn't get because you assume that if I do this, God will give me that. This is not a bargaining game. This is God. God said, it all belongs to me anyway. How are you going to cut a deal with me and I own all of it? It's not a, I scratch your back and you scratch mine. That's, that's a worldly mindset. That's carnal thinking. That's the devices of the world. That's, that's not how the kingdom of God operates. And it's because God has a, a bigger panoramic view of the whole situation. God sees the big picture. God sees the big picture. God sees the big picture. So even when it looks like something negative happens or something evil happens, God says, I will take that and work that thing for your good. Romans 8, 28. And we know, not we think, not we hope, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. All, the, all things, the good things and the bad things, the positives and the negatives, the ups and the downs, in sickness and in health, in riches and in poverty, all things, I'll take it all and work it together for your good. I will work all of it for your good. I'll take the baby mama drama, the baby daddy drama, I'll work it for your good. I'll work the unfairness that happened on your last job, I will work that. Listen, I'm God, just watch me in the big picture of it all. Watch me, watch me in the picture of it all. God says, I'm working on something. I know you think that, Lord, I've been faithful to you. Why did you let my mama die? God says, I'm working all things for your good. I'm working all things. The Bible says that Job was a righteous man who walked upright and eschewed evil, and he was perfect. He called him a perfect man, and yet he lost everything that he had. 
And that wasn't the end of the story. God just said, listen, I, if you walk with me, if you walk with me and work with me, and if you'll wait on me, and if you'll trust my heart, when you cannot trace my hand, if you'll walk with me and wait on me, if you'll walk with me and wait on me, God says, I, I'm working on something. I see the big picture. I see the big picture, and I'll show you what I'm working on. I, I'll do it, Job, if you'll be patient. And the Bible says that the latter end of him, God gave him twice as much. I declare, if you wait on him, if you wait on him, if you wait on him. You remember young Joseph? Young Joseph in the Bible was faithful to God. He had integrity in his heart. And remember Potiphar's wife? She said, my husband is on a business trip. Come here, baby. You look good. I need you to scratch an itch in my bedroom. Come on. Come on in here. And he says, excuse me, lady. But I work for your husband. I respect your husband. But above that, I respect God. And he stood for righteousness and for truth. And not only did he lose his job, he was locked up in jail, falsely accused. God, what in the world are you doing? I do right. I do right. I mean, it, it's, it was like me. I, I got, to, my wife was driving the car one day. We get pulled over. The police officer comes to my side of the door and asks me if I had on my seatbelt. I'm like, you see it on there, don't you? And he says, sir, did you have on your seatbelt? And I said, no, I didn't have it on. And I got a ticket for telling the truth. I mean, I tell the truth and I get punished with a ticket for telling the truth. Lord, I told the truth. I, I'm doing what's right, God. You're supposed to have my back. I did what you wanted me to do. Now, Lord, you, you're supposed to handle this. And a ticket was put on my record. But you got to be able to always see the big picture. God saw a big picture with Joseph when his employer lied on him and locked him up in jail and promoted him out of the jail and put him in second in command. See, God had some, he said, I work all things, all things according to your good. It took a long time, and, and when you, you thought that it should have happened by this particular time, and it hasn't happened within a certain time, all I can tell you is this in the Holy Ghost, I heard God speak this to me today. Swift transition. Sherebanj kumbodos. I heard him say swift transition. Swift transition. It's not what it looks like. You've been waiting a long time, but God says, I'm going to switch it up, turn it. I'm going to turn it on a dime. I'm going to turn it real fast. You're getting ready to have swift transition. Get ready. Get ready. I'm just telling you, you've been waiting on the decision to come. You've been waiting on the breakthrough. God says that you're getting ready to experience swift transition. It's been more than weeks and months. It's been years for some of you waiting on this thing to happen. Swift transition. Swift transition. Swift transition. Swift. Swift transition. God says, I'm going to turn this thing. I'm going to turn your situation. You've been locked up for some years, but I'm getting ready to open the door. They're going to send for you. You got stuff that's been out there, and they're going to send for you. You got the portfolio ready. You got the stuff ready. You just sitting by the phone waiting on the call. And God said, swift transition, swift transition, swift transition. You get ready to go through transition. Transition is different than change. Change is an event that happens. But transition is the emotional, psychological, financial, and relational processing of change. You are getting ready to experience by the Holy Ghost swift transition. Get your business ready. Get your business ready. Get your production ready. Get your team ready. Get, 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 get ready because swift, 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 swift transition. God's going to give it to somebody who's ready to receive it. Swift transition swift transition God knows what he's doing this is not a back scratching situation because God's back is not itching and you're assuming that he needs the same thing that you need 
All that I can tell you is that God is getting ready for some of you in some strategic, swift transition, swift transition. It's going to be where you just wake up and you say, Lord, you did this so fast. I mean, what happened? You're going to know, surely, this is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. You've been waiting on this thing to turn around. Swift, swift transition. Swift transition. Swift transition. Swift transition. It's not going to be huffing and puffing and blowing. Swift transition. Swift, swift. It's going to be a quick release. You're going to wonder what in the world happened. What in the world happened here? Trust God and give him time. And you watch that when God stands up to move, the swiftness of his transition, the swiftness of his transition. Just remember, God does not wear a watch. And even if you think that you're getting too old, he will give you length of days and long life. He'll turn back the hands of the clock and renew your youth like the eagle. They that wait on the Lord. They that wait on the Lord shall renew, shall renew, shall renew that strength. You're not going to look like what you've been through. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. Even though Job was a righteous man, he didn't get bent out of shape with God. He didn't say, God, I've always obeyed you. I've done everything that you told me to do to the best of my ability. I've always walked in obedience to you. He simply said, though you slay me, God, yet will I trust you. Even when bad stuff is happening that I didn't deserve, Lord, I trust you. I don't understand it, but I trust you. I don't understand it, Jesus, but I trust you. I trust your heart toward me, God. I don't understand why I've been having a hard time. I don't understand why I lost close relationship, my support team, and certain things in my life fell apart. I don't understand it. But Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. And if you trust them, if you will trust them, I'm telling you, God will help you. If you'll just trust him, if you'll trust him. He says, though you, though you slay me, yet will, I, yet will I trust you. He didn't get angry with God. He's, he was a wealthy man and lost everything he had. You know what his attitude was? He says, naked came I into the world, and I'm going to be naked when I leave out of here. But he said, blessed be the name of the Lord anyhow. But before it was over, God gave him 10 more children, and he increased his wealth to be twice what he had before, and he was already a wealthy man before he lost it all. And God restore him, restored him. I'm telling you, you're going to watch the hand of the Lord with swift transition. God's going to take you through a process and swift, swift, swift transitions. Getting ready to come your way. Swift transition, swift transition, swift transition. You watch and see what God will do. In this next season, the hand of the Lord is on you. Swift transition. Some of you have been waiting for your time. Swift transition. It is though you've been dark. All of a sudden, Moses was on the backside of the mountain for 40 years. 40 years. And God didn't speak one word to him. And all of a sudden, a swift transition came. And God appeared to him in a burning bush. God's going to set your bush on fire and turn you aside to see a sight. And you're going to realize this is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. He will visit his people. And he's coming in fire. He's coming in fire. He's coming in fire. Because a flood has put too many people's fire out. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, God's coming in like a fire. You watch, watch heaven. You watch heaven. You watch heaven. 
God is up to something. And he's doing something so incredibly divine. Take your seat for just a moment. We're going to go a little deeper. It is interesting that whenever your life is off course, God has a way of shifting you to get you back on course. It was July the 20th of 1969. I was a young boy watching the television this day when man first walked on the moon. It wasn't the first time that a spacecraft had been sent to the moon. The Russians had done it in, in 1959, 10 years earlier. But nobody got out. But 10 years later, July the 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong, two other astronauts on board the spacecraft that blasted out of the Earth's orbit. And the scientists say that 85% of the travel after that was drifting toward the moon because of the fuel limitations. Once it blasted out of the Earth's orbit, it had a gravitational pull. And 85% of the time it was off course. But there were small rockets attached to the ship called thruster rockets. And when it would get off course by so many degrees, a rocket would fire off and it would push it back on course. And there are times that when your life, the same way it reached the moon by these little thruster rockets, God has to blow up some of your plans to get your life back on track with him because your focus got drifted off and you were drifting and didn't even realize that you were drifting just because you were moving. But there's a destiny that God already had in mind. And there are too many distractions pulling us on the left hand and on the right hand that have gotten us off target. So God says, I'm going to blow up these plans right now. I'm getting ready to mess you up. It's a thruster rocket. It's not designed to kill you. It's not designed to hurt you. It is designed to propel you on the right trajectory to be able to reach the moon. That's where you're going. But this time, as God has thruster rockets attached to your life, he's not trying to get you to the moon. He's trying to get you to the sun, the S-O-N. And the destiny that he has already marked out for you, he's got a destiny that's already marked out for your life that will bless you in an incredible way. And I declare to you that if you'll just trust him, God will take you into places that you never imagined. And I want you to realize this, that it is extremely kind of God when he chooses not to destroy us, but to correct us. It's extremely kind of God. He could destroy you, but he chooses, on the other hand, to simply correct us. I want you to notice Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 and 6. But you have forgotten that the scriptures say to, to God's children, when the Lord punishes you, don't make light of it. And when he corrects you, don't be discouraged. The Lord corrects the people he loves and disciplines those he calls his own. When your thruster rockets blast you away from people and blast people away from you, He's trying to get you back on the trajectory that will get you to your destination. Please realize this, that God's discipline in our lives prepares our character for the future of where God's plans, where he got, God plans to take us. Because your talent can take you to a place where only your character can sustain you. And so God disciplines us in our lives in such a way that our character can sustain us in the place that he plans to take us. And my question to you today is, what is the Lord trying to correct in you? What is he trying to discipline in you? And I want you to know he's not mad at you. God loves you. God loves you. In Psalm 94, verse 12 and 13, notice this. Blessed is the one you discipline, Lord, the one you teach from your law. You grant them relief from days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. See, the wicked has dug a pit for you, but one is being dug for them. But blessed, 
Blessed is the one that you discipline, O Lord, not cursed. God loves you. You're blessed. If God disciplines you, you're, you're blessed. If he will give you the time of day to correct you, it's a manifestation of God's love for you. And the one that you teach from your law, he says you grant relief. God's discipline that he's bringing, the correction that he's bringing to your life is going to grant you relief from days of trouble. Relief from days of trouble. May I remind you of this, that when God is good to you as you have not deserved it, as I have not deserved it, that goodness leads to repentance. Those are not my words. It's the word of the word of the Lord in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Notice this. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? I mean that he's wonderful, kind, tolerant, and patient with you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Not to make you comfortable in your sin. The kindness of God, the mercy of God is designed to turn you from your sin. And when you think of God, I want you to think of God with me for just a moment. What kind of expression does he have on his face? Is he smiling or is there a frown when you think of God? What kind of expression is on his face? A.W. Tozer said that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What do you think about God? What kind of expression do you think is on his face? C.S. Lewis said that joy is the serious business of heaven. It is the serious business of heaven. And remember, Psalm 16, 11 says, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So God's, God's smiling in heaven. He's not upset in heaven. He's not, it's heaven for God's sake. It's heaven. It's a place of joy, fullness of joy in his presence. And remember that God's plan for you is for joy. I want you to see this picture of these two gentlemen. That's Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. in their younger years. You're not designed to live life alone. God has somebody to help you to get to where you're trying to go. Frank Sinatra in the late 40s, he was unknown and so was Sammy Davis Jr. But Frank Sinatra was playing in a, in a theater there in New York City. And uh, he went over to see a show over in Harlem, the Will Maston Trio, and Sammy Davis Jr. was the lead act in that trio. And when Frank Sinatra went over to Harlem and saw Sammy Davis Jr. in action, he was blown away by his talent. And he invited Sammy Davis Jr. to come over to New York and to see his show. And a week passed and there was no Sammy. And so here he goes back over to the, the Will Maston trio back over in Harlem, Frank Sinatra did, looking for Sammy Davis Jr. And he waits until after the show and he says, Sammy, what happened to you? I, I was waiting on you to come to see my show. He said, I came. He said, they wouldn't let me in. Frank Sinatra was so upset that he stormed across town and went back to New York City to that theater in front of the owners and tore the contract up in their face. And he was a friend to Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy Davis Jr. then went out to the Copacabana. They wouldn't let him come in. So Frank Sinatra refused to play there as well. And there he was in Vegas and they wouldn't even give him a hotel room. They wouldn't rent a hotel room to him. And Frank Sinatra was with him and he said, give him my room. And then shortly after that, Sammy Davis Jr. had a terrible car accident where he lost his eye. And Frank Sinatra paid all of his medical bills. 
And then five, five decades, number 40 years of knowing each other, Frank Sinatra was being interviewed by a reporter. And he asked him, he said, why is it that you have been so charitable to Sammy Davis Jr.? And Frank Sinatra responded in three simple words. He said, he's my brother. He's my brother. He's my brother. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Sometimes in order for you to get to where you need, you need that brother, you need that sister for God to bring the partner in your life because it is in the duplicity of having two that the right connection just the two in the strength of two is the power to multiply not that you choose but that the spirit chooses for you that has the complementary gifts and strategic positions of influence to bring you where you need to be when you submit to God God will supply to you the connection that is necessary for the place where he's called you in his destiny may I remind you of this that every act of kindness is a seed every act of kindness is a seed and the truth of the matter is is that God sends rain where there is seed in the ground it doesn't rain in the desert because nobody plants seed in the desert but God sends rain he'll rain on your field when you've got seed in the ground every act of kindness be it a word or a deed in every act of kindness there is a seed there is a seed there is a seed in every deed there is a seed and your harvest of blessings will come out of that seed that God sends water for in your life and Robert Louis Stevenson said this don't judge each day by the harvest you reap but by the seeds that you plant don't judge each day by the harvest that you reap. There's so many people that's always looking for the harvest. You're looking in the wrong place. You be faithful to sow. Now listen, God's promise is not for reapers. God's promise is that he will give seed, ideas, time, money, children, connections. He will give seed to the sower. The success of your day it's not measured by the harvest that you bring in that day. The success of your day is based on the seeds that you've taken the time to plant. Seeds of kindness, good deeds, good words, honorable acts. That you've asked God, Lord, make me a blessing every place that I go. Listen, I've never asked God to bless me. I've just asked God to make me a blessing to others. And if God makes me a blessing to others, he's got to bless me. So I've never had to ask God, God bless me. I've always prayed the prayer, God make me a blessing. I dare you to begin to pray that way and say, God make me a blessing. The Lord, I'm available to you. I'm available to you. And whatever it is that you want to do in me and through me, God, I am available to you. I'm just telling you, there is a divine connection. Bresh katabash. There is a divine connection, a divine hookup that will blast your life. It'll accelerate your trajectory. You're getting ready to be postured for swift transition. You watch what God will do in this season. You watch the word of the Lord. When his prophetic word hits and strikes your spirit, you realize this didn't come from a man. This came from God. I don't know you, but God knows you. God knows you. God knows where you are. He knows the struggle that you've been dealing with. He knows how time has worn you down. He knows the injustices. He knows how you sat on the sidelines and watched others be blessed while you were standing there waiting and wondering, Lord, when is my time coming? Swift transitions. 
All you needed was one thing added to you. You got everything that you need, but you need the partner. You need the connection. You need the marketing agent. You just need a representative that knows the right relationship. That one person added to you will unlock everything else that you do, that you need. You watch what God will do. It is the kindness of God. And some of you are called to be like a Frank Sinatra to a Sammy Davis Jr. That you can open doors for somebody, that you can write an injustice that has been done, that you can stand like a brother, that you can stand like a sister, even though you may not be blood related. But when God connects you in kingdom purpose, when you're connected by the Spirit and you realize that God has brought this person into my life sovereignly and divinely for such a time as this, they may not be blood related to you, but yet they are your brother, they are your sister. And God is getting ready to take your life exponential as a result of that so that you can show you his kindness, the same mercy that has been granted to you, the same thing that he forgave you of and blessed you in spite of you. God wants you now to be merciful to others so that you have greater seed in the future for the mercies of God to come your way. This is the time, and listen, when you're kind to someone, you can imagine that when you've been a difference maker in someone's life, they'll never forget you. They will never, ever forget you. When you've caused ripples, they will never, ever forget you. Just, just the ripples. You'll be surprised. I watched Joel Osteen's father take up an offering and gave the whole offering to a Mexican man sent him to Mexico to do evangelistic work. Little did he know that when he was sowing that seed of kindness to a Mexican immigrant to go back to Mexico and to do work, that later that that man's son would come and serve his son, Joel Osteen, and it was Israel Hutton's father. And sometimes the next generation will be able to reap seeds that are sown. It pays to just be kind. To ask God to make you a blessing to somebody else's life. And listen, to some person, you're just one person in the world. Serve that one person as like, as though, the, though you can't do it to everybody, do it to the one. And for that one person, you may only be just one person. You may say, I'm just one person. But also to somebody, you may be one person, but you're the whole world to them because of what you open up to them. You open them up to a whole nother world. And it's that kind of time. God could judge us. He's got a rap sheet on every one of us. He knows every dirty thought, every impure intention in your heart. God has enough to evidence to condemn us at any moment and shut us down but his kindness it's called mercy it is so that it leads us to repentance and I just want you to we hope that you enjoyed that message don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos and if you want to partner with us click the give now button thank you for what you do